On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks make two moves at the deadline and get both P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. Did the Mavericks make the right moves? Did they get the right things? What does the team look like now? We'll talk about that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks. NBA champions. He is it. He it's good. And the Mavericks have won the game. Thank you, If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. Welcome here at Locked On to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day where we let it ride, let it ride for the trade deadline, trade it for guys in their prime. Oh, thanks for being part of the show and making Lockdown Maps your first listen today. With the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day, leave a five star review, like the video, and comment anything below. Let me know what do you think about the trades in the aggregate. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, your easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown NBA and use that code lockdown NBA for first deposit match up to $100. We got trades, two trades. Mavs making moves. Nico Harrison said, I will not sit idly by and watch this team waste away in front of me. (laughs) He did not want that to happen. (laughs) We'll talk about the Daniel Gafford move. We'll talk about what it means for the Mavs. Is the center position now kind of an area of strength? What is that? I I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. The Mavs, uh, a strength? Wow. It's kind of crazy. We'll talk about the buyout market. That's the, all the comments and all the tweets and all the DMs and subtext. That's all I'm getting from everyone is that the uh, the, the Mavs, what, what could they get in the buyout market? And so you, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe say that for the next couple of days because it'll play out over the next couple of days. We don't know a whole lot now, but I'll tell you what we do know now. But let's start here. The Dallas Mavericks do make the move for PJ Washington. Great move for the Mavericks. I think the Mavs get PJ Washington. They also get two second round picks in the deal. They send out Grant Williams, Seth Curry, and a 2027 first. It's top two protected. So that's the PJ Washington trade. They also sent got Daniel Gafford in a trade. Here's the full details of, of both trades combined. Daniel Gafford was traded to the Mavericks. Rashawn Holmes goes to the Wizards as well. And then the Mavericks sent essentially they sent a first round pick. They sent us a pick swap. They swapped their 2028 pick swap with OKC. OKC then sends Dallas their 2024 pick in, you know, to pay for that pick swap. And then the Mavericks sent that 2024 pick that was never theirs to, to the, you know, to the wizards. The wizards will now have the the thunders second round pick this season, which is a draft that not a lot of people think is a good draft. Overall, if you look at both of these moves combined, you say, well, the Mavericks started the day with, you know, a, bu- a bunch of question marks. You have Grant Williams. You have, you know, center position that needs some work. You've got some guys just kind of carrying dead weight that weren't really contributing a whole lot. You've got one first round pick. You've got a couple of, you know, the ability to do a couple pick swaps and you've got two second round picks. So Nico Harrison looks at it and goes, well, what if we get two more second round picks? We send out the first, we use a swap. We get rid of Rashawn Holmes' contract, so he's not going to be on the books next year. That's a positive. Send out Grant Williams, which that we'll talk about how that experiment didn't really work for him. Seth Curry gets traded again. The second time he's been traded, he signed with the Mavericks three times. So after this season, if they don't re-sign him, then maybe maybe he comes back for a fourth. (laughs) That would be insane. That would just be wild at that point. And then the Mavericks keep P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. With P.J. Washington, we'll start with him first. The Mavericks are betting that Grant Williams to P.J. Washington, that the Mavericks are making enough of an upgrade there to garner that first-round pick. It's only top two protected. That means that the, the the Hornets had leverage. And we heard it all throughout this week that the Hornets were, well, you know, I don't think we're going to trade this guy. We'll just hold him until the offseason. The same thing with the Wizards. The Wizards didn't trade Kuzma. But the Mavs do get P.J. Washington. I think P.J. Washington is an upgrade over Grant Williams in a couple ways. The idea of Grant Williams was very different than the player that Grant Williams ended up being for the Mavericks. He shot the ball well at the beginning of the season, did not shoot the ball well 
throughout the last, I don't know, 40, ga- 40 games, basically. His defense did not live up to the hype that we gave it, that I gave it, and that he gave it, honestly. He didn't live up to that that billing. And it was going to be a situation where he would have to take a step up, where Grant Williams would have to take a step forward to be as good as the Mavericks hoped that he would be for what they signed him to be and all that. And so he just didn't live up to it. He didn't take that step from being a ninth, 10th guy on the Celtics to being a fourth, fifth guy on the Mavericks. That's a big step to go from a ninth, 10th guy to a fourth, fifth guy, a guaranteed starter. That's what the Mavericks hoped that he would be. Grant Williams told us all through the the offseason, and he likes to talk. Sometimes, like, you've got to cash a check, you know? Like, eventually, like, you've got to cash it. And it maybe it wasn't enough time. Maybe he was dealing with injuries. Maybe, you know, could so many different things. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Ifs and buts were candies and nuts. What's what's that stupid phrase? I need Isaac back to, (laughs) to do the phrase wrong. But the Mavs now have P.J. Washington, who is about the same age, 25 years old. He's an inch taller, much longer wingspan. He's got a 7'2 wingspan. That's a big deal when it comes to defensive, you know, uh, when it comes to defensive things. He has shot the ball decently well, about 36% his whole career. It's gone down over the last couple of years here with the Hornets as the Hornets have gotten worse. So I think that probably uh, the types of shots he's getting and all that probably matter. LaMelo Ball has been in and out with injuries. Him playing next to Luka Doncic is going to be good for his three-point shooting. He can make shots, and he can score. He's had a couple 40-point games in his career, and the Mavericks need a couple guys every once in a while to be able to score 40. He's scored 20 points this season nine times. He scored 43 the one the one night against Utah a couple weeks ago. He scored 32 against Miami. He had a couple 26, 25. You know, he's had a couple of games like that, and the Mavs just need a couple extra guys that can hit that, that can do that, can get him that any, every once in a while and be solid on defense at the same time. It seemed like before this trade, they had one or the other. You can either play solid defense or you could get them 20 on any given night, right? With the with the Tim Hardaway, Jaden Hardy, Josh Green. It's like, all right, trying to figure out how to get the, the right thing out of this team. Now with PJ, you come in with a guy that everybody says, you know, all the Hornets fans, or at least I was listening to Walker Mel of Lockdown Hornets, and he just loves PJ and talks about how, professional he's been and how he he's a you know worker and comes you know comes to work every day and all that like they need they add a guy like that and that is just a a great person to add to the Mavericks as a person and as a you know player the locker room somebody that everybody can get along with and all that not saying that Grant Williams wasn't that he's definitely a talker It, it just didn't live up to it his mouth wrote a check that his game couldn't cash I got it I got there I eventually got there. But P.J. Washington now comes in, and I think there's just expectations that he'll be a starter and that he'll be a solid starter. He wasn't a starter on the Hornets. Not great. (laughs) It's not a great sign necessarily, but the Hornets have their own kind of issues, and I'm not exactly sure what the Hornets are doing over there. Uh, You know, they have, but they have Brandon Miller, they have Miles Bridges. And so those guys have taken the the forward spot. They have Gordon Hayward too. So like they had had guys that they wanted to prioritize and develop ahead of, ahead of PJ Washington. Different spot, different, different scheme, different all that. You just can't play Gordon Hayward, PJ Washington, Brandon Miller, and Miles Bridges all in the starting lineup at the same time. So PJ ended up being squeezed to the bench. And so now the Mavericks can try to maximize what PJ does well And they can, you know, and he doesn't have to like stand out too much. You just have to be solid. Just be solid in that role. Hit threes, play defense, be switchable, be versatile, and all that. We've also seen P.J. Washington be a really good defender when he's playing next to a good center. This season, if you look at any of his advanced stuff, it doesn't look good. The defense is not good when P.J. Washington's on the court. It's not good when he's off the court. Like, it seems like he doesn't even impact defense through all the other metrics. But if you look at when he played last season, when Mark Williams was healthy, when he played with Mark Williams, who was kind of the same center as Derek Lively, when he played with that type of center, they had a pretty good defense with the Hornets. And so I believe that P.J. Washington can be a solid you know, defender next to Derek Lively, and then he adds to the Mavs' versatility. And basically, what the Mavericks decided to do is, you know what? We liked the idea of Grant Williams, and we would like to that to work this time. And they went and got P.J. Washington, it was an upgrade there. It's fascinating because PJ Washington and Grant Williams were in that same class in 2019. PJ Washington ends up going 12th and Grant Williams goes 22nd. And there's a lot of draft people on Twitter today as the deal went down going, 
man, we all were debating Grant Williams versus PJ Washington throughout that whole thing. The draft ended up being PJ, and then this trade ended up being that PJ has more value and is is better. Coming up, let's talk about Daniel Gafford, and let's talk about these deals in the aggregate. Was it a good asset day for the Mavericks? It's probably the secondary thing, but was this a good day overall for the Mavericks? Talk about that and more coming up. Today's episode brought to you by Nissan, the Nissan Pathfinder, the Nissan Armada, the Nissan Rogue, all kinds of great SUVs that you can check out for Nissan. Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capability to take your adventure to the next level, just like we went through this adventure today with the trade deadline. All kinds of stuff that you can get there. So go check out the Nissan Rogue, perfect for cities and great escape, great escapes. They have Google built in as you're always up to date with your assistant to call for almost anything. So you got that Google Assistant built in. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. You can also check out the Nissan Armada. It will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada to go to your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Again, NissanUSA.com. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. Appreciate each and every one of you for checking in and watching the show. We are a five-day-a-week Dallas Mavericks podcast, so we go all throughout the week, and then I do every post game as well. So check the show, all that. Subscribe to the subtext if you want bonus content and everything. I'll probably be doing some more stuff about the trade that, that were happening today, and I'll do some watchback videos and things like that. Subscribe to subtext. Click the link in the description. You get text straight to your phone and all that. All right, Isaac, let's talk about the... Uh, Daniel Gafford side of this trade. So Daniel Gafford also gets traded to the Dallas Mavericks. Daniel Gafford is a 6'10 center that's been starting for the Wizards this season. He started 53 games two years ago, 47 games last year, and 45 out of 45 games this season. He was their starter. He's 6'10". He's 25 years old. He's a guy that can grab a lob. He's a guy that can grab a rebound here and there. He's averaging about 11 points and eight boards in 26 minutes. Those minutes are going to go down. So all that other stuff is going to go down, but also 2.2 blocks in 26 and a half minutes. So his per 36, he's getting like almost three blocks a game <laughs> in the, in this. Now you can't play him 36 minutes. So it's kind of unfair to do that. He averages three fouls a game. So Lively and him are going to struggle with foul trouble, but you know what? You get 48 minutes of good center play, or at least solid center play. And you know what? You get 48 minutes of 6'10", 6'11", center play. <laughs> this is a move for the Mavericks. Now, they had to give up they had to give up the pick swap in it. And they had to, you know, they had to do that. They didn't have to give up first, but they ended up giving up a, a, a pick swap with the, with the Thunder for 2028. That's four years from now. Will the Thunder be better than the Mavericks four years from now? That's the question you got to ask yourself. But in doing so, they got Daniel Gafford. They didn't give up their two seconds. I thought it would be for the two seconds. But they didn't give up that. They gave up the swaps. They still can trade two firsts this summer in July. Won't be at the draft, but it's, it's, if, they give, if they give the pick to the Knicks that's this season, they'll have two, two firsts to trade this summer, which will be big. So you get Gafford. You do take a step forward, and that's a big deal. And also, same thing with P.J. Washington, but with Gafford, he signed for another couple of years. He's making... 12 million this year, 13 million the next year, and then 14 million the year after that. Lively's still going to be on his rookie deal all throughout this. So you've got Lively and Gafford to be your two centers for the next three years, for the rest of this year and the next and two years after that. I think this is really solid for the Mavericks. Uh, the swap is you know concerning. We'll talk about the, the assets and all that later, but let's just focus on the player. The player that you get is is good. We'll take this guy. And I'm I'm probably going to hear like, oh, he's got these limitations. He's not that good. Guess what? He's a backup center now. That's fine. You'll take all the limitations because you'll take the size. You'll take the rebounding. You'll take the, the shot blocking. And the Mavericks now take their center position and where it was a weakness last year. Think about all the the centers that they tried and they were working through. Remember JaVale McGee at the beginning of the season? Remember Christian Wood? Remember Dwight Powell having to start all these games? Remember Maxi starting a bunch of games this season? Or remember Rashawn Holmes coming in and like, listen, Listen, you guys are excited about Rashawn Holmes. Rashawn Holmes. And now it's Lively and Gafford. And so now the Mavericks have one of the best backup centers in the league. That's a thing that I'm not used to. Lively and Gafford. Some nights they're going to be interchangeable. Some nights Lively will have to be out and Gafford can start and he can spot start. And that's totally great. That's a totally great spot for him to be in. I think he's set up for success, especially playing with Luka. Who is he playing with on the Wizards? Tyus Jones, I guess. 
But playing now with Luca, playing in this in this you know in this defense where they're actually gonna, they're actually going to try to play some defense. The Wizards don't play defense, guys. They just they just don't. So Gafford was probably hunting a bunch of blocks, which is uh, which is not great. So his block numbers will go down. So if you're a fantasy person, I would not like really get into Gafford and be like, oh my gosh, he got two blocks a game for the Wizards, and now he's going to the Maverick now. I just I don't think. I think this is a solid move. Now I think center becomes a position of strength for the Mavericks. They don't have like the best starting center and, you know, but they've got probably a top. Man, if I start counting, I can get in trouble. They probably have a top 20 center. You feel good about top 20. And then you've got maybe like the fourth or fifth best backup center in the league. You think about some of the backup centers around the league. You go. Isaiah Hartenstein is probably the best one. Steven Adams with the Rockets now is pretty good. And then you start going through them and you're like, you know what? Daniel Gafford is a really good backup center for the Mavericks. We'll take that. We had talked in the past about should the Mavericks trade for Daniel Gafford to start as their starting center last year and the year before that and even th- before this season. Love it. Great move. I think this is a really good move for the Mavericks. They also move off of Rashawn Holmes' contract, so they move off of the money for next year. He was going to have like a $12.9 million player option, and so that changes now, and so that's big for the Mavericks. Now it seems like they're going to have... Um, now it looks like they they have some more... They have some guys signed up for longer term, so you've got... You know, next year, your team is basically set. Um, Derek Jones Jr. is not signed next season. Dante Exum has a non-guaranteed, but you'll expect him to come back. And then everybody else that is on is pretty much signed next year. So you're pretty much set going into this offseason. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, if only, I just hope we can sign this guy. It's not really a problem right now for what you got. P.J. Washington signed, Gafford signed, Lively on a, you know, on a uh, rookie deal. You got Kyrie on a, on a deal next year. It's all pretty much set. So now you look at what these two trades have done for the Mavericks and you look at what they are now. They've gotten bigger. What's one thing that we desperately needed the Mavericks to do? Get better. Get bigger. Both things. I meant to say bigger, but better was the Freudian slip that that was necessary. Get bigger. They did. I thought they got bigger in this. Now you look at and you say, all right, we're taking 6'6 Grant Williams, turning him into 6'7 with a 7'2 wingspan PJ Washington. Okay, a little bigger, but but bet, but like you feel better about that. And you go, okay, well, we're gonna take, you know, Dwight Powell and turn him into Daniel Gafford. I feel good about that too. You feel good about that overall. You lose, you know, Grant Williams, Seth Curry. Grant Williams had under, you know, had, had not played up to his billing, and so he was playing off the bench. Seth Curry's not really a loss. Rashawn Holmes not really a loss. And then a couple of picks and stuff. So you add already. Now you're moving a couple of players down, too. You're moving them down a couple of pegs. Now Derek Jones Jr. probably comes off the bench. Now Dante Exum doesn't have to come back right away. I think you start Josh Green. I think you start P.J. Washington. Lively, obviously, Luka and Kyrie. And then your bench all of a sudden looks looks like pretty good. <laughs> you, take, you take your bench, if those are your starters, the same five, Luca, Kyrie, Josh Green, P.J. Washington, Derek Lively, your bench is Tim Hardaway, Dante Exum, Derek Jones Jr., Gafford, Maxie, Jaden Hardy, and then Pro- Omax and Dwight Powell in spot places. I just feel pretty good about that. They took a step forward. Definitely, they took a step forward. This is not like, all right, they fixed all their problems, and now this team should go gangbusters and try and like compete with the top four teams that are tied for the number one in the West right now. Like it, it's not that they're, but they're probably going to, I think they should, if they get healthy, that's the other thing. If they can keep healthy, then I think they can make a little bit of a run, get back up into that top six, stay out of the play in. And I think that's what these moves did. I think these moves helped them push forward and definitely help some of their weaknesses, size availability. These guys are available. Like what Daniel Gafford's played 45 games this season. He's missed, you know, three or four games this season. PJ Washington's been pretty available for the for the Hornets as well. So you get some guys that are gonna play, you feel good about it. It's all about health for Luca and Kyrie and Derek Lively. So you still go back to it, but then you feel better about the guys. Plus, these guys are young too. Both Gafford and PJ Washington, both 25. So you add to your future. That's that's what I think I feel better about. Today. You took a little step forward. For the future, you feel really good about all these guys. Tim Hardaway becomes expiring next year. Maybe you move off of him and do something else this summer with those two first-round picks. So you can make another move then. Combine him with, like, Maxi's salary, and you can get up to, like, you know, $27 million. Combine it, combine it with Dwight, and you can get up to, like, 30 or something like that. 
And then all of a sudden, all right, now you feel pretty good about this Mavericks team in the like going forward in the future for next season. And that's what, that's what I've said about this season all along. This season, figure out how Luka and Kyrie play together. Figure out who else can can play around Luka and Kyrie in a potential title run next year. That's what we're talking about with Luka. When you have Luka, you, that, that's what you got to focus on. All right, coming up, let's talk about this. both these trades in the aggregate asset-wise. Did the Mavericks do a good job asset-wise? Did they spend wisely? Were they smart moves? And let's talk about the buyout market a little bit. We'll talk about that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks Daily Fantasy made easy. It's demon time on Prize Picks. You can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $100 into 1,000. Every once in a while, you just need to turn 100 bucks into 1,000, right? It feels like I'm one of those finance guys on TikTok. Why doesn't everyone, if you're not taking $100 and turning, or $10 and turning it into 1,000, you're just, you're giving up. You're not doing the right thing. There's always those finance guys on those, those videos with podcasts. Uh, go check out Prize Picks. See what's available for you. They have all kinds of stuff. The Demon Time and Goblins. They're the newest and most exciting way to play Prize Picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins give you different payouts. So they're different and they're fun. You can check out some of them that are available right now. Like Christian McCaffrey has a little green goblin emoji next to it. 0.5 rushing and receiving or receiving touchdowns for him in the Super Bowl. You've got to... Select more on that one so you get a little bit better of a payout on that one if you if you want. Brock Purdy, 199 and a half passing yards. That's got a little goblin next to it. I add that. I decide to do that. Uh, you can add Travis Kelsey, 49 and a half receiving yards. I do all of those. I put down 10 bucks. I can win 16 on that. If I put down 100, I can win 160. So that's kind of fun if you want to do that. Add a couple more. Your money goes up. And then also... Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use that code LockedOnNBA for first deposit match up to $100. Prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Shut it down! Oh, Let's go home! All right, let's get into the rest of this trade deadline for the Mavericks. The aggregate, the trades that they made, the trades overall, you look at what they did. They get P.J. Washington, Daniel Gafford. So you get a solid starting wing. You get a solid backup center. You get two second-round picks. Feel good about that. You lost Grant Williams, Seth Curry, Rashawn Holmes, the first-round pick that you could trade, the only one that you could trade right now, and a pick swap in 2028 with OKC. Overall, this asset day felt okay to me. You paid for what you got, I thought. Especially with the market, not a lot of good players moved today. Bogdanovich, Bojan Bogdanovich, probably the best player that got moved today. Quentin Grimes got moved. You start looking around and you go, man, I think the Mavericks probably had the best day today. You got Buddy Heald, went to the Sixers for a couple of seconds. Gordon Hayward went over to the, uh, you know, the Thunder. Maybe he's the best player overall when he's healthy, but that's just a, it's always when he's healthy kind of deal. I think the Mavericks may have been, they're the one of the only teams that moved a first round pick today. And it was because the competition was was tough. <laughs> it was tough. And teams like the Hornets and like the Wizards didn't have to trade guys that they didn't want to. So the Mavericks had to pay. So you lose that, that pick swap. If the Mavericks are worse than the Thunder in 2028, at least they still have a first in that draft, but they take the less of those. So if the Thunder are like the best team in the league, which they could be in four years, right? They're almost that now. <laughs> if they're still that in four years, four years is a long time. But if they're still that, then the Mavericks get the worst of those two first-round picks, so that could come back to bite you. You lose that 2027 first. That that stinks. And this summer, but you still have two picks as long as the Mavericks give away, finally, the 2024 first-round pick. So their first-round pick this season, they owe it to the Knicks. If they finally give that pick away, they can still trade two first-round picks. And so this summer, you took one step forward now at the trade deadline. Love it. Love that they took a step forward. They didn't waste time. They've taken a step forward in each of the last two opportunities they have at the draft, at free agency, maybe at free agency. I guess with free agency with with Derek Jones Jr. and Dante Exum, they took a step forward. The Grant Williams thing didn't work out, so you didn't really take a step forward with that. But at the draft last year and at the trade deadline, you've taken steps forward in both of those opportunities, and they they really needed to, and you got better. You got better in both of those instances. Love it. So now take either the, take either free agency or the draft this season. It'll probably be free agency this season to make another trade to push you into 
contender status to get that one more piece. I feel you feel pretty good about it overall. The Mavericks, though, one problem. I've got one problem with what they did today. I said all the positives. I went through all the positives first, okay? Don't come after me yet. Not yet. The one thing I have a problem with is they keep having to make up for their mistakes. I saw Josh Bowe of Mavs Moneyball tweet this. I usually don't agree with Josh Bowe on a lot of things. I'll, I'll say that to his face. <laughs> but I do agree with he, the Mavs keep having to make up for their mistakes. And they keep having to pay for their mistakes. They sent a pick swap for 2030 for Grant Williams. Now they send another first to get off of Grant Williams and to get P.J. Washington. Would P.J. Washington have been worth Grant Williams a first and a pick swap? Maybe. Maybe. But they're paying now they're paying to get off of that move. If Grant Williams had just worked out, then you wouldn't have to do that. You could send a first and add Grant, you know, add PJ Washington to what you had already and not have to move off of Grant Williams and then get PJ Washington. So they keep having to make up for some of their mistakes here. It feels like Daniel Gafford having to trade a pick swap to go get him is making up for the mistake of Christian Wood last year. They tried it, they risked it, it didn't work for them. Like they keep risking it on some players and trying it. And now we'll have to see if PJ, PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford have both not made the playoffs and have both not been on winning teams. They've been on the Wizards and the Hornets for their whole career. And so we'll have to see with these guys. They're risking it on these guys. It's not, it's not a guarantee for these guys. And so they did give up assets to get some of these guys that are not guarantees. It's what they could do. They did what they had to do. I like the moves and all that. But you look at it and you go, all right, they are spending. They're being aggressive. I saw Haralba tweet this. Haralba Valgaris used to work for the Mavs front office and be you know, an analytics guy for the Mavs and for Mark Cuban. He said, this is aggressive. This is a, this is a, these are aggressive moves from the Mavericks to spend, to go get guys. They didn't get these guys like cheap. It wasn't like, oh man, they only they got PJ Washington for like a couple seconds. They got Daniel Gafford for, you know, they didn't, get, they didn't do that. First round picks were moved. And th- those are a hot commodity. Not many moved today. Not many moved this whole deadline. Three were moved for Siakam. They didn't move any for OG and Anobi. Harden, there was a couple, right? Not many are getting moved right now. A lot of teams hold a lot of first-round picks, and they're, it seems like they're really valuable right now, especially ones that are not protected or owned or swapped or anything like that. So overall, I think they did good to take a step forward, but you got to watch some of these some of these assets start going they're limited now in the summer. They have two first round picks. They've got a couple of contracts they can use. They got to take that next step. And these guys have to work. Because if all of a sudden Daniel Gafford ends up like Christian Wood, PJ Washington ends up like Grant Williams, you're in a tough spot. You're in a tough spot if you're the Mavericks. It's all going to depend on health too. The last thing, you're killing me with the buyout stuff. <laughs> so the Mavericks now, they are one of the teams that can get you know, buyout players. They acquired two players today. They sent out three players today. So they've got a roster spot. They also have Markeith Morris's deal that's non-guaranteed so they can get rid of him even if it wasn't guaranteed. It's just like a minimum. So you don't have to worry about that. Spencer Dinwiddie got traded to the Raptors and he got bought out. So he is available. Spencer Dinwiddie is available. Dinwiddie is earning more than the non-taxpayer mid-level exception. He made $20 million this year. And so that means that there are certain teams that can't sign him. Those teams in the second apron. This is why I was talking so much about the Mavericks can't get into that second apron or first apron because it limits you. It's not just about, oh, why are you counting the owner's money? Why do you care what the owner pays? Just let the owner pay. It's not about that anymore. It's about what flex, what you can do flexibility-wise because the new CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, limits you in certain things. So the Warriors, the Clippers, big one. Celtics, big one. Suns, huge one. Bucks, big one. Denver, massive. Miami, huge. All those teams cannot sign Spencer Dinwiddie. And it looks like right now, at least from the last thing I saw, the Mavericks and the Lakers have expressed interest in Spencer Dinwiddie and to bring him back. That would be somebody I would be interested in. Obviously, we've seen Spencer Dinwiddie on this team. He played his best basketball probably in the league with the Mavericks. I think he would really work. Bring in a 6'6 guard, and he takes the spot of Tim Hardaway when you need someone to get a bucket instead of what Tim Hardaway does. (laughs) Honestly. He takes a spot of Jaden Hardy as well in the rotation. And I think that helps you. They some, Every once in a while, they need an extra ball handler and creator. And I think Spencer Dinwiddie would fit that. And so I think the Mavericks are, are pretty well positioned to get somebody like that. And they need one more guard, it feels like. In the playoffs, when you got Luka and Kyrie, if they're both playing and they're both healthy, you feel good about it. But as soon as one of those guys goes down or is not on the court, you're struggling to try and figure out, all right, how do we work this all out? 
So I think Spencer Dinwiddie would be a good one in, in a buyout. We'll see what happens. The Mavericks are in on him. So we'll talk about that as it goes on. Slightly and I will also have an episode today after the Knicks game. So come back after that. I'll also be on Lockdown NBA talking about all the deals that went down today. There you go. Appreciate each and every one of you guys. Thanks for listening to Locked On Mavs. Peace out. Boom. Boom. 